So uh, welcome again. Uh, my name's Rory Edmonds. I'm the Data Site Samples Community Manager. Um, and I'm delighted to moderate this, uh, the second webinar of the second series of the Better Together webinars, where Crossref, Data Site, and ORCID come together in these webinars to focus really on the, the APAC community. And the webinars have the aim to deliver content and conversations that are relevant, interesting, and useful to stakeholders in the region. Um, and the theme of this third webinar is really around uh, implementation cases uh, for sort of working with multiple persistent identifier PID systems in APAC. We'll focus on the realities of working with multiple PIDs. What are the drivers for working with multiple PID systems? For example, uh, governance technological aspects. How are strategies being implemented for working with multiple systems? Uh, and what does all this mean for any organization planning to implement PIDs into their workflows? So we'll, we'll start with two invited talks um, from Lu, uh, Lulu Zhang uh, from CINIC and uh, Yoshihiro Hirao from JST JALC, followed by uh, some shorter presentations from each of the hosting organizations, Crossref, Datasite and ORCID, um, before using whatever time remains for Q&A. Um, a couple of quick caveats up front. Unfortunately, Lulu has to leave uh, directly after presenting, but we'll ensure that any questions uh, reach her and uh, are answered. Um, and also, uh, Fabian cannot join us, but Lena will speak and show a video uh, on behalf of Fabian. And also, um, really sadly, due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, Shaoli Chen also cannot join us live today and has shared a recording of her talk. Uh, and my colleague, Paul Fikant, and I will attempt to answer any data site questions on behalf of Shaoli. So um, that, that's it. Let's get underway uh, with our first invited speaker, um, Lulu Zhang, uh, who is Deputy Director of the Data Publishing Lab of uh, the Computer Network Information Center, and who will present on multi-identifiers uh, multi -identifiers implementation on ScienceDB. So uh, please take it away. Lulu, I'll stop sharing and let you go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, I think everyone is able to see my full screen now. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. It's so great to see uh, so many people across different countries to join this webinar. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about multi-identifiers on SAS Data Bank. Uh, first of all, SAS Data Bank is an open and general purpose data repository. It serves for data sharing, no matter uh, privately or openly. As for open research data, it is actually a pillar of open science. It can bring a lot of benefits, not only for uh, individual researchers, but research communities and the society. Uh, I just list some of uh, uh, these benefits like enhancing uh, transparency, crediting the research, um, enabling replication, improving usability, uh, enabling uh, replication, improving usability, building new uh, co uh, collaborations, advancing research, and so forth. However, only the data files themselves cannot be well found and reused by others. So how to share your research data effectively and what is a better practice? Actually, you need to provide more metadata to describe your data files when shared them online. Obviously, more comprehensive your metadata is, the more likely your data will be discovered and disseminated and more useful. So the enriched description of the metadata is very important. Generally, uh, researchers are encouraged, encouraged to share their uh, data by the following ways. One recommended way is to publish a data paper or a data descriptor at an academic journal or data journal like uh, China Scientific Data, Scientific Data from Swim Nature, 
uh, didn't, pre didn't break from elsewhere and uh, so forth. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, another recommended way is to publish a data availability statement as an interview research article uh, to tell where and uh, how to assess your data. Sharing your data independently, I mean, with no peer-reviewed publication is uh, also a recommended practice. In the first two practices, uh, when it comes to where uh, data files are stored, depositing them onto a data repository is always a better choice. Uh, some studies have shown that putting data in repositories was the only method for data sharing significantly uh, correlate with citation impact. They suggest that more common methods such as sharing the uh, SI are uh, of less value to a researcher in gaining credit. When data are deposited uh, on data repository, data will be assigned a data will be assigned a global unique and persistent identifier. That's why data could be uh, formally cited. Uh, usage and matrix can be tracked. Also, data can achieve long-term story, both lessening and reuse of uh, data uh, will be made clear. And uh, data files, uh, and, uh, uh, and the data files, uh, will be accompanied by enriched metadata when do so. And uh, data repository can ensure reliability and uh, standard based of a service, provide policies and uh, standards company service like fair principles and so forth. Besides, with a multi PIDs like DOI, SSTR, uh, RR, uh, all key and so forth, the, uh, repository can enhance uh, connectivity and uh, dissemination of the data. That's also a reason why putting data in repositories can bring more citation and effectively credit your research. This is also the service capability provided by Sense Databank. So then I want to talk about SenseDB. Well, SenseDB uh, is a non-profit open and public generalist data repository. Uh, it provides data publishing and accessing service to the global scientific community and ensures a long-term management and persistent accessibility of the data. And uh, it promotes a practice of a fair principles. As for its uh, service concept, SenseDB aims to make research data sharing uh, easy and low cost uh, to support peer-reviewed of uh, associated uh, articles whose supporting data require uh, open sharing. Uh, in terms of uh, data management, it aims to ensure the data integrity and persistent accessibility, so does to facilitate uh, data as open as possible, as closed and necessary. Um, for the data usage, uh, it aims to enhance data reusability, meanwhile protect the rise and the interest of relevant stakeholders. Uh, it also engages in enhancing data dissemination and promote their feasibility. Furthermore, it uh, tries to track data usage and explore to instant data sharing behaviors among scholar community. Meanwhile, it endorses a trusted principles of data repository. And uh, as for its uh, milestones, uh, it was launched in 20, uh, 2015 by Computer Network Information Center of CAS. And uh, since 2021, it has been recommended by many publishers as a general uh, repository uh, involving Smooth Nature, uh, Cell Press, Elsevier, Taylor Francis, you know, and so forth. And uh, all its open content has been indexed by uh, international uh, databases like uh, Google Dataset Search, uh, Data Citation Index from KRV, uh, Manda Data from Elsevier, uh, Open Air Scholars from Europe, and so forth. 
and uh, since 2022, such DB has been a uh, designated platform by multi uh, policies from Chinese Academy of Sciences, National Press and Publication Administration, China Association for Science and Technology. All of uh, these policies, if I saw all the researchers uh, from CAS and almost all the academic journals in China. And also, since uh, 2022, Sansevier has been uh, a number of uh, data sites, and now uh, Sansevier is a registered repository on a uh, data site. And uh, two now, uh, depositors across more than uh, 19, 90 countries and uh, regions have shared their research data uh, on SenseDB. And the researchers from over 190 countries and regions have downloaded their data uh, for their research. Uh, then I will talk about the services provided by SenseDB and how it integrates uh, with multi-identifiers. As a global uh, open and public data repository, SenseDB is built upon a powerful uh, data story uh, environment and uh, equipped with uh, PB level processing capabilities. And uh, its network environment is built upon uh, China Science and uh, Technology Cloud. Uh, and set up, it also set up over uh, 2,000 and uh, 800 global citizen nodes and uh, 500 overseas citizen nodes to ensure settable and uh, unblocked network transformation. The, uh, the repository is open to the global uh, scholar. Uh, so anyone can register an account on SaaSDB or just uh, use your Orchid account to log in the system. And uh, then you can uh, upload your data files and share your data via SaaSDB. SaaSDB uh, also integrates with third part manuscript, uh, manuscript systems uh, via, uh, via persistent identifiers to, to uh, to implement it. Uh, we uh, established the links between the uh, manuscript and uh, data sites uh, to, to uh, complete this uh, integration uh, process. And also the system uh, provide multiple data accessing mode surveys uh, involving open access, embargoed access, restricted access. Uh, meanwhile, uh, SenseDB can provide policy and uh, uh, fingerprint symbols, uh, fingerprint symbols complaint service. Uh, all the record deposits on SenseDB are assigned with global unique identifiers, not only uh, DOI number, but also a uh, size TR number. And SenseDB assigns DOI numbers uh, and assess TR numbers when the record submission is created and uh, registers them uh, in data site and the SenseTR platform when data are published online. As uh, more comprehensive the metadata is, uh, more likely the data will be discovered and uh, more useful SenseDB employs identifiers to enrich metadata on it and register them to this site, involving DOI of associated uh, papers, uh, ORCID of depositors, RR of organizations, and so forth. Meanwhile, uh, SenseDB provides uh, open APIs for public to access all this enriched metadata uh, with follow the standard the schema of ORD. Uh, Dublin call and data site. Um, it also provides a free service following the open protocol of OI PMH. Uh, upon this, both human and machine can uh, easily can easily access them uh, with no barriers, including uh, search engines uh, like Google Scholar. What's more, by the global unique identifiers, 
uh, data probably uh, data published on SensorDB can be formally cited. We also prove as a standardized citing format service like SensorL uh, on the landing page of the each data. Uh, it will help data dissemination and reuse and uh, uh, explicit data lessening is another essential part to ensure reusability for data. Uh, all the metadata on SensorDB are under CCO license and uh, uh, the, the system also the system also provides some CCO license or uh, seven CCO license, uh, twelve software licenses, and uh, and three OD uh, ODC license options uh, for uh, to uh, to to user to choose. And uh, SensorDB also does a lot of efforts to promote the connectivity and the dissemination of uh, data records it published. First of all, uh, the whole website of uh, SensorDB provides bilingual services in Chinese and English. Uh, and uh, all the metadata published on SensorDB demand to be at least in English. Uh, meanwhile, based on the enriched and standardized metadata with identifiers, data published on SensorDB can be included by many third party uh, databases that uh, I've mentioned previously. And uh, uh, it means that uh, data shared on SensorDB can be easily discovered by anyone across any countries and uh, by various uh, identifiers. We also construct an entity relationship graph to link the data and literature. And all these links have also been uploaded to data site. Uh, so the point that uh, I like to stress is that data and uh, uh, that uh, not only data records uh, on SensorDB, but papers associated with, associated with data and uh, referenced by the data, uh, data depositors and uh, their affiliations are stored and interconnected with identifiers on SensorDB. And regarding uh, scholars, uh, ORCID are uh, used to identify a data depositor on Sense Data Bank. Meanwhile, a uh, user can sign in Sense V if it's an ORCID account directly uh, under uh, authorization. Um, so, tracking data usage uh, is another useful service site Sense to be provided to depositors. Uh, the website uh, depicts a geographical distribution of the data views and the downloads, helping uh, depositors uh, to know about which con uh, to to know about uh, uh, which countries and the regions uh, the scholars with similar research interests come from. And uh, SouthDB also collects uh, users' feedback on each data record, uh, such as uh, behavior of their rates, likes, and shares, and uh, displays them on the landing page. And the tracking citation of the data is another important for basing on identifier. Uh, the citation data is collected uh, from Google Scholar and dimensions by identifiers uh, in SensorDB well. Uh, in 2022, we are joining into uh, another significant work called Make Data Count. Uh, uh, this uh, actually all of uh, this uh, metrics and uh, uh, and uh, uh, all of uh, this metrics uh, have been pushed uh, to uh, make data count mostly by SenseDB. So uh, the key takeaways. Uh, Actually, uh, deposit research data on the data repository. Uh, deposit research data on the uh, data repository is a most effective way to share your data openly. And uh, SensorDB integrates multi uh, identifiers, make research data more connected and uh, more easily uh, discoverable. And uh, actually, not only research data but all the results entity require identifiers. Uh, Thanks, uh, thanks for listening and welcome you reaching out if you uh, you have any queries about the report and uh, sense B. Thanks, thanks so much.
Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Lulu. Um, now, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, Lulu needs to, to leave now, sadly, um, but um, please do use the Q&A functionality and we will ensure that any questions that you do have will reach Lulu for a response. Um, so thanks, thanks again, Lulu. Um, so our next invited speaker is uh, Yoshiro Hirao, who's from the Japan Link Center. Uh, which is the National DOI Registration Agency for Japan. Um, Hirao-san is going to present on uh, the multi-PID implementation strategy of JST and JALC. Um, so when you're ready, please go ahead, Hirao-san. Okay. I shared my screen. Rolling. And we can see it. It's perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I am Yoshiro Hirao and in Western style and Hirao Yoshiro in Asian style. First, good afternoon to APAC countries and good morning to Europe and African countries. I work for Japan Science and Technology as the JARC Secretariat. Today, I would like to talk two things. The first one is Japan Link Center this is organization I work for and its service. Second topic is just the information services working with PIDs, PIDs. Okay, just two things, very simple. The first topic is overview of Japan Link Center. This is the slide to introduce Japan Link Center. The DOI array of Japan established in 2012. Japan Link Center is jointly managed by four Japanese governmental institutes, including JST, NIMS, NII, and NDA. And the content coverage is journal articles and books, research data, e-learning, and et cetera. Number of member is 73 regular members and about 3,000 associate members. As shown here, our members can register DOIs, not only JARC DOIs, but also cross-ref DOIs and data site DOIs via Japan Link Center. The next slide shows a key stat. Number of DOIs we registered exceeded 10 million last year, later last year. Among the 10 million, about 8 million is JARC DOIs. Uh, Cross-ref DOIs, about 2.6 million. Data site DOIs is still low but growing. Number by content type is shown below. As shown below, three four, uh, three fourth about journal articles. But recently, research data is growing. Annual growth rate AGR is about thirty one percent, while journal articles AGR is four percent. So research data is growing rapidly. This slide explains our unique service. JARC plays multiple roles. DOI array of Japan, at the same time, we are member of data site and a member of cross -level. JARC members can select any of the JARC DOI data site DOI and cross-left DOI according to their wish. With any selection, our members will deposit their metadata to the JARC system instead of accessing data site or cross-left system. Then JARC system will access to data site or cross-left system, cross system to register their DOI. In such a way, JAL can be the central information hub of Japanese academic results. 
and once stored, anyone can get almost all the metadata by using JALC REST API. We provide metadata openly along with our open metadata policy. And so next slide, how we manage, we manage multiple array. We used, we take translation model. Our member register metadata along with JARC scheme. A member with JARC DOI, we straight go to DOI foundation system. But if a member requests cross ref or data set, data site schema, JARC system will translate the schema to cross ref or data site schema and access to each system and then cross ref DOI or data site DOI. Then we store all registered metadata regardless of which array. That's the system and services we are going with JARC array, with multiple array. That's about Japan Link Center. Next is JST information services working with BIDs. As shown here, JST provides various information services. Platform and database is about 16. Today, I would like to pick JStage and JStage data as the companion service, and JKI preprint service, and JST funding database, and and search services, okay? The first one is JSTAGE, which has more than 3,800 titles. Online journal platform for Japanese academic associations. Its companion services, JSTAGE data will store research data and each system register DOI via JARC. JSTAGE register DOI for each journal article. JSTAGE data register DOI for research data. So each has DOI and linking via DOI. So this is an example of linkage between general articles and research data of JST services. Next slide is information services of funding. JST provides information service at the same time a major funding agencies. So JST has project database for each funded research project. And, and each web page has each project description and local number. And having this web page as a landing page, we registered grant DOIs. So in summary, JST funds researchers each of funded project, JST developer landing page and JST registered grant DOI. So funded researcher does not have to worry about those things. This might be a unique feature of JST because JST funding agency and provides information service at the same time. The right hand shows uh, such services. 
this is a meta search or cross search across multiple farding agencies. In Japan, uh, there are five major farding agencies. Among the five, this search system covered JST and Kake. When you input some professor name, uh, you will see he will get some funding from JST and some funding from Kake in the single screen. Next is our ORCID collaborations. The first example is Japan Exit. Japan Exit uh, and ORCID integrated in two ways, search and links and auto updated. The number is shown here. Uh, lots of people registered by search and links. Just three steps. Authentication. At authentication from chat web page to ORCID page. From ORCID page to JAL page, both way are possible. In such a way, authentication done and search and link or auto update. Just do it. In such a way, works registered in JAL will go to ORCID each person's work page. That's the integration we are doing. Next ORCID integration is JKive. JKive is a preprint server from JST. This covers both Japanese and English uh, preprint articles. But this preprint service should keep the quality, so submitter uh, must be a researcher. To do that, JCAB requires a researcher ID to submit re submission. It requires research map ID or ORCID ID. Research map is a Japanese researcher directory from JSD or ORCID. In such a way, this service is also integrated with ORCID. In such a way, we would like to continue to promote such PID connection in the future. That's, thank you very much. Rory, thank you. Yes, thank you, Hiro-san. Sorry, I was a little uh, surprised uh, that uh, that was that was the end, um, but thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, so yes, um, again, if you have any questions for Hirao-san, please do use the, the Q&A and we will have some time at the end to uh, address those questions. Um, right, so let's uh, swiftly move on now to a, a set of presentations from the Better Together organizers. And we're gonna start with um, two talks from Crossref. And they're going to be presented by uh, Lena Stoll, who's live with us, um, and Fabienne Michaud, who will be on a recorded video. Um, Lena and Fabienne are both uh, Crossref product managers, and they'll be discussing uh, ORCID IDs and RAW IDs in Crossref metadata. So when you're ready, please go ahead, Lena. Sure, thank you for the intro, Rory. Let me try and share my slides first all right you should see them now yes we uh do. right <laughs> thank you okay so uh thanks for the intro my name is lena i'm going to be representing as rory said two of us here today because um fabian is on some well-deserved leave um and we were thinking on the theme of better together from the crossref perspective um we'd like to show you some examples of how we integrate with uh, persistent identifiers that aren't kind of our bread and butter of DOIs um, to make sure that the whole can be greater than the sum of its parts. And I will show you what I mean by that in a minute. I will start off by 
speaking of the different ways in which we integrate ORCID identifiers and then Fabienne later on or her pre-recorded self um, will explain to you what we've been up to with raw uh, research organization registry identifiers because there is some um, exciting news on that. But I start off with ORCID. Um, so most of you are probably somewhat familiar with Crossref. Uh, bear with me though for just a minute as I give you a very brief introduction on who we are. So Crossref was founded in the year 2000 in the distant past um, with the primary mission then of allowing our members to register and retrieve persistent identifiers. Um, and some in the community probably still mainly think of us as a DOI provider, membership goes in and DOIs come out. But we've been working for the past years pretty hard on um, a number of other services that mean that we see ourselves now as an open infrastructure provider, not just their PID provider. And we make research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess and reuse. Um, Crossref is a membership organization, so we have tens of thousands of members and they deposit their metadata with us for um, a wider and wider range of content types. Um, we also hold very different and various types of metadata, um, basic bibliographic data about titles and authorship and all of that, but all the way to things like funding information and affiliation identifiers and reference lists. But um, because we're on a tight schedule, I'm going to focus just on um, ORCID IDs for contributors today. And just to explain why we care about integrating different PIDs. Oh, that was one too far. Okay. Um, this is an illustration of uh, our vision of what we refer to as the research nexus, which is a rich and reusable open network of relationships. Um, which connect research organizations, people, things, and actions. And we would like it to be a scholarly record that the whole global community can build on forever for the benefit of society, which is a grand statement. Um, and in order to build this, we can't just focus on this inner circle of um, individual entities, people, outputs. You can see all sorts of different um, content types here, but more and more we're trying to focus on the relationships between these entities, which is the outer layer of the diagram that you can see, um, you know, have there been updates to something, who has cited it, who has funded it, um, all those kinds of things to interconnect the research nexus. And so now already, but even more in future, we believe that the value of Crossref comes not just from the DOI itself, but from its metadata and from all of the links and relationships in those metadata capturing this rich research nexus. Um, and we operate very consciously as an open scholarly infrastructure. We make all of our records and all of their connections and relationships visible and trackable um, through our APIs and our open metadata. And of course, we work together with a lot of different organizations to identify and capture all of these relationships because we can't do it alone. Um, I'd love to say more about that, but we do have a pretty tight schedule. So just to give you an idea of the numbers behind this picture, we have recently registered our 150 millionth record. Um, and of these 150 million, about 12 million uh, metadata records contain at least one ORCID ID in the metadata, so we have quite a lot of connections to work with there. Now, to get more specific um, about the integrations, there are we've already heard a brief mention of uh, auto updates and search and link wizards, and those are also for us the two main ways in which we harness the power of integrating ORCID. Um, we just heard from Jalk that. Um, in their case, the, the search and link wizard is the much more used one. Um, we see it in our tools the other way around. The more impactful integration in terms of volume probably is our uh, ORCID auto update service. And just in very brief, how that works, even though many of you are already aware of this by now, is that when 
um, metadata gets deposited with Crossref and there is uh, a contributor's ORCID ID included in the metadata by the member who deposits it, then we as Crossref can, with the consent of the author who uh, owns the ORCID record, um, we can push details about that work automatically to their record and also keep them up to date later on, which means that not only the, does the author not have to do all this work themselves and enter all of their metadata, um, but there is also a single source of truth that makes sure that all of the metadata in different places um, agree with, with each other. And um, we can keep them up to date if anything changes uh, after the initial deposit of the work, which happens quite frequently. Um, but of course, this does mean that the publisher has to collect the author's ORCID ID in the first place during the manuscript submission process. Otherwise, the Crossref system has no way of knowing who they are. Um, and also, in order for this to work, uh, I already mentioned consent. Authors have to opt in to the author update service. And we have worked together with ORCID to implement notification that gets sent on the ORCID platform and gets triggered to the author whenever their ID is first included in a deposit by a member with Crossref. There are also notifications sent whenever the um, auto update system makes a change to the author's record so that they ultimately always have control and have the final say over their record. Um, and I already mentioned volume at the beginning of the slide. Um, so you can see to date, we've updated three and a half million um, ORCID users records with this integration. And you can also see that it's not just journal articles that we do this for, but um, there's a wide variety of content types, including increasingly preprints. So that's just a side note. And then the second integration that I just briefly wanted to mention is um, a little bit more subtle, but no less powerful. Um, so this is our search and link wizard. This what I'm showing here is a screenshot of our um, Crossref metadata search service, which is a search bar like you know it from many other places on the internet. Um, it is made to be used by human beings typing things in rather than by machines like many of our APIs are. Um, so you can go here, you can search all of Crossref records by name, title, DOI, whatever else you're interested in and find relevant uh, relevant records. Um, and I wanted to show you an example of how we've integrated ORCID here in the search service. Um, unfortunately, I had to go back all the way to 2015 to find any, 2014 even, uh, to find any examples of my own scholarly output because I didn't have the most uh, prolific <laughs> scientific career. But I did, uh, after some searching, find um, a couple of records, one of which, as you can see, the ORCID integration knows is already on my ORCID profile, but the other isn't. And um, the auto-update service that I mentioned just before can be forgiven for not finding this record because actually the uh, auto-update integration didn't exist yet when this was published. Um, but of course, there are a lot of other reasons why auto-update might miss a record. So think the publisher didn't include ORCID IDs in the metadata, then of course, um, we wouldn't be able to auto update on the author's ORCID. Maybe as is often the case with first time authors, um, the author doesn't have an ORCID record yet until after the publication and then they create it later on. You can imagine a lot of scenarios where it would be useful to manually add work um, or maybe they just haven't opted into ORCID auto update. And in this case, if I want this second record to be on my um, to be on my ORCID, uh, I can hit the add to ORCID link, and it will immediately update my ORCID record, which will then look like this. So you can see all of the beautiful metadata that Crossref holds um, is added automatically to my ORCID, and um, it will also tell anyone who views my record that I have added this myself via a search and link wizard. If this was added by ORCID to update, I would have a nice green tick here um, to show that this is a what ORCID calls a validated assertion that was made by a trusted party, as opposed to me going in and adding it myself. And that is the very, very quick whistle stop summary of the two different ways in which we work with ORCID records and how um, 
by integrating them with everything that we hold in the DOI, we can um, make the whole research nexus more interconnected. Um, I think that, yeah, I will hand right over now to my colleague Fabienne or her virtual identity, because between the two of us, we only have 15 minutes. So her video um, at the end of it has a slide that shows you how to contact us, how to ask questions, where you can find more information. We wanted to um, save some time by not including two versions of that. So just consider her talk to be the second half of mine. I will also stick around until the end of the webinar, though, if you have any questions and do my best to answer them right here. And then, of course, also stay tuned for a talk from ORCID themselves, from um, my colleague Estelle in a bit, who will go a little bit more in depth on all of the concepts that I've mentioned here. So thank you very much. And I will try to change my share to Fabian's video now. Um, if you can't hear it, just let me know and we'll try and troubleshoot. So take it away, virtual Fabian. Hello, my name is Fabienne Michaud. I'm the product manager at Crossref for the Funder Registry and Similarity Check. I just want to give you an update today on the work we're doing to include raw ideas in our metadata and why we're doing this. For those of you not familiar with RAW, it stands for Research Organization Registry. It's a global community-led register of open persistent identifiers for research organizations, and that includes funding organizations. Raw ideas can help with disambiguation. You can register and link raw ideas. They can be registered with all content types, including in affiliations. have been registered with Crossref as part of the metadata we've received from our members. There are 5,760 different rules registered and grants are still the biggest content type that have raw ideas associated with them, but peer reviews and journal articles are growing quickly. RAW is supported by Crossref, Datasite and ORCID. As you may have seen in our uh, recent communications, uh, we are working to bring the Funder Registry and RAW closer together and are planning to merge the Funder Registry into RAW at some point in the future. We do not have an exact timeline yet, but the Funder Registry will be available until at least the end of 2024. Crossref and RAW are working closely on this initiative and RAW have done quite a lot of work on matching records. They are currently close to um, 34,800 active funder ideas and over 104,000 raw ideas, with obviously quite a lot of overlap between the two registries. And um, we'll publish on the Crossref and raw blogs more information on this in the coming weeks and months. We're working to um, we're working on collecting raw ideas in our schema, where we currently collect funder ideas. We're also working on the integration of our ideas and their relationships with funder register ideas in our next generation metadata, metadata model. More technical information is av available on the ticket listed on the screen. We've been supporting the funder registry for over 10 years in collaboration with Elsevier and it's well established. We had always hoped that it might be we might be able to support one registry for both the funder and affiliation use cases, cutting down on curation, integration and administrative overhead. The transition won't happen overnight and we'll support funder registry identifiers in our schema and in our tools and services until the community is ready to transition. I thought it would be interesting to see a funder registry record and a raw record for the same funder side by side, in this case, NERC. In the funder registry, the funder is linked to the research output. In raw, um, it's more about the organization, its relationships and other identifiers. And you can see that the parent child relationships, for instance, are much clearer. And obviously, once we have merged the two registries, you will have the best of both worlds. We have published a blog post um, earlier this month about our plans to merge the funder registry and RAW and eventually deprecate the funder registry. Crossref and RAW are started, uh, have started a consultation with a small number of publishers to identify the practical challenges in their workflow and inform our transition plans and how we will communicate with the community. 
We're also working with service providers such as Scholar One and Editorial Manager to plan this change. So what can you do? Well, if you're not doing this already, you can start collecting and sending raw ideas with affiliation metadata to Crossref. If uh, you have any feedback or questions about raw ideas or Lena's presentation on multiple PIDs, please get in touch. Thank you. Okay, I guess that was it for myself. I'll hand it back over to you, Rory. Thank you very much, uh, Lena. And also please send our thanks to, to Fabian. And um, as uh, Lena already said, uh, she will be here um, until the, the, the end. So uh, uh, when we have the discussion time. So again, please, if you have any questions for, for Lena or for Fabian, uh, please add them to the q and I'm sure Lena probably can handle both, but if not, I'm sure I'm positive she will pass them on to, uh, to Fabian who will get back to you. Um, okay, so... Um, Shali Chen, uh, who is the project lead of the Fair Workforce Project at DataSite, is our next presenter. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, Shali uh, cannot join us live today. And so I will ask my colleague Paul to share her recorded video. Um, and I see he's already got it up. So thanks, Paul. Take, uh, take it away. Thanks, Rory. And hi, everyone. And I uh, hope you can hear the audio. All right. And we'll start the video from. Shall we now? Paul, I think we have a problem with the sound. Oh, very can you hear it? On the phone. Now we can, yes. So maybe restart. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this webinar. I'm really happy to present on the topic of working with multiple pits from data size perspective. I will very briefly touch on the following topics in a very short talk. Introduction to data site, uh, PID strategies and approaches in different parts of the world, categories of common PIDs and their characteristics. Then we move on to how data site meta schema is designed to accommodate the interlinking of different PIDs, and what, look, what it looks like from the perspective of the researchers community and some principles for best practices. So DataSight is a global nonprofit membership organization working with over 2,700 repositories in the world to provide DOIs for research outputs and resources. So collectively, our community has created over 52 million DOIs for scholarly resources up until today. Um, like scholarly research, persistently and uniquely identify resources as part of scholarly communication has also been a global endeavor driven by leading stakeholder groups across the world, including national level policymakers, regional consortia, and working groups. I have identified some of this effort on this map, by no means a complete picture, but already quite impressive how prevalent PID related coordination and adoption strategy making effort are represented globally. In the UK, there's JISC's national PID research strategy, and the PID policy for uh, European Open Science Cloud in Europe, while our colleagues at the US Department of Energy leading the effort in formalizing and implementing PID adoption across fed, uh, federally funded institutions in compliance with national open research mandates. In the Southern Hemisphere, Africa, South America, and Oceania, each have been working on the original PID implementation plans, particularly the Australian Research Data Commons, ARDC, has led a working group in the RDA context to produce case studies <clears throat> of 11 countries' national PID strategy work. Zooming in on the uh, APAC region, uh, the situation is particularly complex, if, even if we only look at the DOI registration agencies. We have five different registration agencies across this East Asian countries, and some are run by national level nonprofits, some are run by commercial companies, some are only for scholarly contents, some also for other type of contents. And they are all operated with different level of openness and interoperability. In fact, this is exactly the situation that inspired me to organize this webinar. Um, 
So in 2020, the Freya project published his survey for current pit service landscape. So in it, the authors addressed this mix of pit coverage and usage. It says an entity can be referred to by several equivalent pit types. For example, ISNI and ORCID IDs for individual researchers, as well as PMID or PMC or DOI for publications. There are historical and functional reasons for this. First, repositories need to manage their own records, not just resolve pits to the location where specific interest can be found. And secondly, resources may also be operated in mixed models of identifier assignments. This reality of diverging and overlapping use cases, operational models of PID registration, man maintenance, and implementation urges us, uh, colleagues who work in the close vicinity of scholarly resources and open science practices, to, to pay close attention to the evolving landscape of persistent identification. Also from the Freya project, an accompanying document on choosing the right PIDs for your particular needs outlines some useful dimensions of comparable features across three big categories of PIDs. Those are those for people, for scholarly outputs, and for organizations. Know that although it's only from three years ago, that this has already evolved with some PIDs in the process of being merged or deprecated and some new ones emerging. For people, there are ORCIDs, ISNI, Web of Science Research IDs. For output, there are SBN, ISSN, DOI handles, et cetera. And for organization, there are Ringgold, ROAR, LEI, and KSI for niche, for niche domains. And uh, they can be compared across these following aspects. The use cases, some PIDs are uh, used by resource types. Some are catering to different user groups and they have different governing models. Some are community driven, some are institutional, institutionally backed. And they also operate with different level of technical capacity like interoperability with other PIDs. And also some are have more strict metadata requirements, some don't. Um, and more fundamentally, what type of human infrastructure are supporting these PID operations? Are there uh, collaboration and coordination? Um, are there uh, workflow integration supports? Or are the organizations um, engaging in continued uh, active engagement with the community? So all this should be carefully considered when drawing up a PID adoption plan. Um, the four is people who work in the intersection of scholarly resource management and open research. So this is a data side view of community stakeholders and to what, what extent are they and can they actively engage in and contribute to the various aspects of PID adoption work. We have the data side members community, which is a broad church consisting of research organizations, that repositories, and policy-making bodies, funding organizations, et cetera. And they are the only group that are grading the DOIs, as well as engaging all other aspects of PID adoption, including integrating the workflows to PID creation and usage to enable discovery of scholarly resources and promote the reuse of uh, scholarly resources. We have the integrators who are, who are the tools and platforms that integrate PIT functionalities, but do not create the DOIs themselves, but enable other organizations to do so. And they engage in the three other aspects of work. Uh, and uh, we also have a wide range of collaborators, these are organizations and project groups who will help us and work with us to uh, enhance discovery discoverability and reusability. And finally, we have policy making uh, bodies uh, that we work with to um, make PID implementation more, um, more of a reality. <laughs> and uh, work was also done through the EOSC Fair Impact Project to align a joint value proposition of PIDs across the key PIDs organizations. And these are PIDs and metadata are needed to enable fair research. And they also enable uh, global scaling of research through unique and standard, standardized identification of scholarly entities. 
is improve understanding of research impact through interoperability and connectedness. It helps stakeholders save money and time through automation. It improves trust in research by facilitating recognition and preservation of diverse range of outputs. It improves equity across disciplines and countries by increased recognition of research contributors. And finally, it supports long-term preservation and sustainability of research output through community governance. Like moving on to uh, data site metadata schema and connection metadata. Uh, currently, the data site metadata schema is at its version 4.4, consisting of 20 metadata properties. It's in a hierarchical stru uh, structure. Uh, and the uh, properties have different cardinalities. Some are mandatory, some are recommended, and some are optional. Uh, some of these are repeatable, and uh, some are with controlled least values. Um, importantly, there's a connection method that allows the interlinking of different types of PIDs. For example, a paper citing a data site can have a uh, data set can have their uh, cross-reference data set DOI linked. A person authoring a paper can the researcher ORCID ID and the paper cross ref DOI can be linked together. Etc. This metadata help facilitate interoperability between these PID systems uh, and open research in infrastructure in general. So together with PIDs, this connection metadata help anchoring the key components of the research ecosystem, like make them interconnected, and set up the sustainable framework that allowed information on research activities, productivity, and impact to be aggregated over time. And this process needn't be arduous through system integration. Connection can be made at the point of sharing. Many repositories you may already be familiar with has already enabled user to associate their resources to related entities through DOI like Zenodo, Figshare, and DMB tool. So finally, some general points to make about best practices for various stakeholder groups. The researchers, we enable them to identify, manage, and share research outputs to cite data and other types of resources when they are being reused to learn about and utilize existing infrastructure and services, and finally engage in the open research agenda setting. We want to hear from the researchers themselves to how, uh, about how they want this landscape to evolve. In terms of institutes, we encourage them to support paid metadata infrastructure and workflows to join or lead a community of practice, to prioritize openness and interoperability when choosing service providers, and uh, help the ecosystem to generate rich and comprehensive metadata. For research funders, we encourage them to set out uh, set output tracking goals, to implement funder and grant ID workflows, to get researchers, uh, to guide researchers to effectively manage uh, their data and engage with stakeholders in their community to, enc uh, to encourage uptake. So I have links of reference used in this presentation here and throughout the slides. I hope, uh, hope you will find this useful. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. And my colleague Paul will be taking your questions live. Okay, thank you, Shirley. Um, and yes, as Shirley mentions, Paul, if you have any questions, we'll be able to answer them. So please if, uh, add any that you have in the Q&A. Um, right, uh, so okay, uh, now for our final presenter of the day is uh, Estelle Chang, who is uh, an engagement manager at ORCID. And Estelle's presentation has the, the nice and interesting title of Shine Together, Orchid and Pids in a Row, which I'm really looking forward to hearing what that uh, what means. So um, I think you're muted, Estelle, but over to you. Uh, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. I want to say happy Friday and I apologize. You can listen to my kids because actually it's a holiday here so I apologize but I will do my best and yeah let me start sharing my screen
Okay, yeah. Here we go. And again, I apologize if you hear any, you know, children's voice. That's yeah. <laughs> really my daughters. And hope, yeah, hope they also enjoy this webinar. So yes, today I'm very happy to be here. And the uh, presentation today is really focusing on pets and how different pets work together and shy together. And let me how to do the next step. Just give me a second. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to start from a high level. Yeah, oh, sorry, just a moment. I apologize. Yeah, so uh, I want to start from the high level kind of um, code and to really stay that piece alone, do not provide much value. The value really comes through embedding pits in other different systems and connecting with each other and visualizing those connections and leverage those relationships. I think this is really a very nice code or nice message, capture the great variety of of pigs and how they should you know, work together with each other. So uh, I still want to start from uh, some high level facts if you uh, kind of reintroduce or introduce Orchid Bit. So Orchid is a non-for-profit non independent, independent organization registered in the US. So it's launched uh, in 2012. So it's about roughly 10 years birthday, we just celebrated last year. And now we are fully sustained by membership fees. So as an individual researcher, you don't need membership. You can always sign up an ORCID for your use. Uh, now we work with members. Members uh, means different types of organizations. And we are guided by our values and the funding principles. And uh, we are really a community governed organizations. So we are governed by a board of directors that are actually elected for our member organizations. So this is uh, also a high level um, kind of uh, summary of uh, where ORCID is now. So we, uh, with the community support and growth. So now we have a broad adoption around the world. We have users uh, in now almost every country, of course, just a few left. And we have member organizations in 57 countries now. And there are really more and more researchers. They do really use ORCID. So more than just sign up for ORCID ID, they kind of actively use ORCID in different and research workflow. And there are uh, more than 4,000, nearly 5,000 systems that having ORCID in their um, different uh, workflow. And then we have more than 1,000 organization members as shown here. More uh, information, you can visit our statistics page. So ORCID stands for Open Research and Contributor I identifiers of provide three main services. The first is ORCID ID. It's a unique persistent identifier page free of uh, charge for researchers or people who contribute to research. And the second is that uh, in addition to the ID itself, we have the ORCID record or sometimes called ORCID profile as actually not shared. So the ORCID record or profile is connected to ORCID ID. And in the ORCID uh, record, you can see uh, different kinds of information, research information from employment, education, and research output, et cetera. And ORCID provides a set of APIs, those APIs that, and uh, as well as some support and services so that research uh, member organizations can use those APIs to connect among different systems to exchange research information. And this is the OK record if you haven't seen it. And you can see there are different types of research information there. So uh, most of research information from affiliations or funding, et cetera, can be, uh, so researchers can add those information by, uh, by themselves by logging into the OK record, but there are still uh, some certain parts that now we only only available for member organizations to add for more transparency and trust. That's the peer review part and the research resources part. And this is um, a high level kind of diagram I want to share with you about. So we have now in, so far in the webinar today, we have PEATS for researcher, that's ORCID, and we have PEATS for research organizations or related organizations, that's DOOR, and PEATS for outputs like DOIs, and PEATS for fundings and grants as well. So ORCID uh, in this ecosystem, we associate researchers with institutions and research outputs through different links to other PEATS. 
And um, from here, I'm going to actually reiterate the concept of um, yeah, ORCID is a PID itself for sure, but ORCID or our services and features are, are all uh, together actually built from different PIDs implementations as well. So ORCID worked with various PIDs to kind of uh, enhance or to build our services and features too. So there are three things I want to share today that's auto or automatic updates. Actually, Nana uh, explained this quite in more detail. So I appreciate it. And I hope everyone now has more understanding about that part. And the other uh, one I want to share is uh, researchers can add works by DOIs or uh, identifiers. And the other is search and link wizards features. So uh, this is actually a quite similar diagram that Lena shared. It's the auto up update workflow really um, demonstrates the power of PITs. So basically I'm going to quickly uh, summarize the workflow again. So it's done from researchers that authenticate or connect their IDs in the manuscript submission process or where they deposit data set in a data repository. And for those publishers or data centers where they register DOIs, they can, uh, of course, they need different metadata in registering a uh, DOIs and ORCID is a part of them. And then when those DOI registered agency like Crossref Data Site and now also Japan Lake Center and Korea DOI. So now we have four DOI registration agencies support this auto update feature. So they will kind of um, check metadata if there are ORCID IDs, then they will push those research outputs metadata including different types from publications or like research data sets or even like patents, if that's the case, to the OK registry. And uh, so those uh, kind of newly updated research uh, outputs publication information will be updated into um, researchers' OK records. And re really, this is really the from the community feedback we learned, you know, it's a very useful kind of, um, demonstration of PEATs and save time for researchers. And again, and also kind of um, indicate the source, the, the source of provenance, like who is adding what. So that's the first thing I want to share. The second is about, yeah, so uh, probably you already know, but I also want to share it again that for as an individual researcher, you can add more works uh, by, by identifiers. So this is the example of adding works by DOIs. So, and the most RAs support this. And the third feature is uh, search and link wizards. So uh, researchers can use this service to claim their research outputs. So again, Lena in her presentation share quite in more detail. I'm just more going to be a more kind of high level recatch here. Um, so if you are a researcher, when you log into your working records, you can see the search and link wizard part. And when you click it, you will be prompted to authenticate or connect your ORCID IDs to the services. And I'm using the base uh, example here. And once you click oh, authorize, you can you will be redirected direct to the service page and you can just kind of um, complete the rest of part. And, and I also want to share that now ORCID members, I apologize, so ORCID members, now we, we they work with ORCID and different PIDs provider to enhance their services through um, different PIDs like the ORCID integration. And this is just on left and uh, right hand side, you can see uh, last year we have more and more member organizations that really adopt ORCID into their workflow. So the primary feature is that for ORCID members, they can add information. So uh, this is the example. So when working member organizations, they can update by connect with the member API, they can update information into their researchers' ORCID records. And there are different um, kind of use cases. So for research organizations, you can add affiliations. For publishers, you can add research outputs and reviews. For funders, you can add funding items and those will give the um a very transparent like who is adding what as you see the uh, kind of illustrations here and those we call trust markers because it's a transparent connection among people places and things and those can be further used to help in any decision making or any related research process and the third one i want to 
introduce a bit more is about probably less people know this, but if you are an OK member, I mean, your organization is an OK member, you can actually request your identifiers to be added into ORCID as we as I share. So the true value from you know connecting with each other. So there are three, uh, uh, you can see the full list in our website. So I choose three as example here. The first one is actually CSTR as from uh, Lulu Zhang, she shared. The second is from the European uh, Biometric Bio, Bioinformatics Institute. So they also have their local identifier. The other is from European PNC. So actually you can use your unique identifiers to add information back to the OK registry. So last but not least, I also want to mention a little bit that so if you um so if your organization you your organization is a is an OK member and you haven't figured out how to start with, we encourage you to check our CSP program page. So we uh, recently relaunched a new um program that we work with different uh, service providers, vendors that provide products and services for research organizations or different stakeholders in the research ecosystem. So you can easily, uh, our members can easily integrate uh, ORCID into their system. And, uh, or if your organization is a service provider vendor, you want to work with us, please just directly let us know. Uh, ORCID membership is not mandatory if you want to join the CSP program. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so basically for organizations use those certified platforms, you can just kind of turn on those functions built in those systems and you can immediately uh, adapt ORCID into your workflow. So uh, the full list now is available in our uh, web page. So the the last slides is about a high level kind of um kind of uh, reiteration or kind of capture about really is collaboration in the scholarly ecosystem through pits. So I just uh marked a few pits here, but of course it's not exhaustive. Just uh, some just a few here, and uh, as researchers. A very important part in the research workflow, and we work with different systems. And so, yeah, I just want to again, this kind of uh, correspond to my presentation title is about Pete's Shy Together. Thank you, and please feel free to connect with me and apologize for my children's distraction, but they're okay now. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Happy to learn your feedback. Uh, let me stop sharing. Okay, perfect. Thank you very, very much, Estelle, and certainly no need to apologise. That was uh, uh, quite entertaining, if I'm honest. <laughs> and as uh, and as the uh, as life would have it, you know, obviously they became quiet just as you were getting towards the end. But never mind. Um, yes, yeah, so we have um, eight minutes left on the clock, um, and for any uh, questions that you might have, and and if everybody would like to turn their their cameras on and, and and mute if they so wish Estelle I don't know if that how easy that is for you but I'll I'll let you decide um we don't honestly have any questions in the Q&A so I would like to give um the uh, the everybody attending one last opportunity to add a question if you have anything's burning from any of the presentations you've seen um but while we give people that last opportunity I was just wondering if there was if any of the the speakers or anyone else that sort of included the uh, sort of Paul as well um have any questions for any other the uh, any of the other presenters any sort of information that you skipped over a little bit that you'd like to add a little bit more detail to because of time constraints or any I suppose any real take home messages that you would like people to to sort of if there's one thing that people walking away with that you would like them to to really have in the back of their mind when it comes to sort of using multiple persistent identifier systems. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody has anything, but if, if you do, um, it would be great. Uh, I have a quick feedback. Uh, sorry, I turned off my camera, as you may know. <laughs> it probably is better for me to turn off my camera now. Hope, appreciate your understanding. But I, I, I really, yeah, I mean, thank you, 
all the speakers and all the, the audience today. It's Friday afternoon or morning, so I appreciate that you join our webinar this Friday. I think one thing I want to kind of um uh, encourage people to, to think about uh, for different paid adoption is actually through info uh, infrastructures to probably you can start to check about what system repository or submission platforms, uh, you know, systems that you are using. So because now as data side, they also have a certified program. So probably you are using a system actually both already support or can data side DOIs. So it's easy for you if you haven't really start working with PITS. So I think that's probably a quick feedback I can think of now. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, Stan. If I may, uh, Rory, uh, to add. Yes, please go ahead, Paul. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, yeah. With our service provider program, um, and and with the, with the one that that Estelle just presented for Orchid, uh, I think it kind of shows how important it is, and what kind of what kind of work we as open infrastructures, uh, as Crossref, Data Site, and Orchid are, and as well as uh, Aurora. Um, that we collaborate and work together in order to, to make things work. And um, as you can see with the title of this webinar series, it's better together instead of just trying it uh, alone. And and the one step benefit is, is institutions and researchers worldwide to to really uh, not take in too much, um, like bothering too much about how things can work. But we, we uh, try to make it happen by collaborating on an uh, infrastructure level. Um, and and trying to to um yeah connect and and leverage the the um the services that we have in order to collaborate on this and um just as a side note uh, or as an ad and promotion I uh, will paste uh the the uh, link to our annual community meeting in the chat so you can um tune in uh, to to many other uh, interesting sessions where we discuss different uh, aspects of of open infrastructure funders and all that stuff so. Um, yeah, we invite you to join us on uh, October 12th. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and Hirao-san, is there anything you would like to um, to say or, or Lena or before we finish? Oh, Hirao-san, you're unmuted. So I, <laughs> I assumed you had a grand closing statement. Um, I mean, I can echo everyone else's uh, sentiments. It's um, even though okay, most of us work day to day in the space, it's really great to take some time to uh, to listen to each other's presentations and perspectives on things. But um, yeah, I think the overarching um, idea that I'm going away with today is just that. Um, there can there is no one uh, head to rule them all that can kind of uh, solve everything. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we know from popular culture that that's not a good idea. Um, uh, and that it really is important that we all, um, you know, stay stay in touch and make sure that we collaborate and um, and also keep other heads in mind whenever we. Um, develop our own little space of the big research nexus and um thank you so much everyone for um for taking the time to to present your perspectives today it was really really exciting for me thank you very much lena uh, and uh, again hirasan if you have any final words please go ahead or but don't don't feel obligated <laughs> <laughs> okay good Okay, I have one word, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday to everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hiroza. That's uh, that's a, maybe a nice closing statement. Um, right, sorry, so... Sorry to oh, interrupt. Oh, that... oh, oh, sorry, I just want to use this chance to um, publicize that we have the third Better Together webinar, before I forget. So this is the link. Oh. I just share in the chat. So we have a third one, Better Together Now, um, focusing more on peace and open science, which is so important across the community. So please, everyone, feel free to register if you haven't and spread this to your networks. Thank you.
so yeah, I think Paul and Estelle have stolen some of my thunder from the from my opposing <laughs> statement. But anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, so right. Uh, that so I think uh, with those words, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We really hope you found the webinar useful. Um, the slides and recording will be shared with you soon, hopefully um, next week. Um, and I would, uh, as Paul sort of already mentioned, we, we'd obviously take this opportunity to invite you to the upcoming data site community meeting, which takes place on 12th of October. That meeting is really open to anyone and is designed so that many of the sessions are at an APAC friendly time. And Paul has posted the links uh, to the event pages in the chat. So please uh, do, do have a look at that. Um, and finally, uh, very finally, please be sure to complete the survey when we close. Um, and um, as Estelle has done already, um, and you'll see it more coming from our communication channels, we have the registration open for the next Better Together webinar, uh, which takes place at the start of November. So many, many thanks again and see you next time. Take care, everyone.